सच्चिदानंदय विश्वत्पत्ति हेतव तापत्रय विनाशा श्रीकृष्णा वयम नुम वी रिमेम्बर भगवान कृष्ण हिज दि ओनली वन हु कैन हेल्प अस फाइनली एवरी वन एल्स वी सीक हेल्प फ्रॉम अवेंचुअली नीड्स हेल्प But if you don't want to be helped once and for all, you have to ask for help from the some from the one who doesn't need help. Janmadhyasya yaton vayadi taratas charte shwabhignya swarat te ne Brahma hridaya adi kavaye mushyanti yat sura yaha te jo vari mridam yatha vini mayo yatra trisargo mrsha. धामना स्वेन सदा निरस्त कुहक सत्यम परम धीम दिस फ्रेज त्रिसर्गो मृषा मीन्स वॉट वी एक्सपीरियंस इज रेलेटिव एंड द रीजन फॉर दैट आवर ईगो इज एन एल्यूजन आवर सेंस ऑफ इंडिविजुअलिटी इज फॉल्स So everything that comes from that also has to be of the same nature. Everything made out of wood is flammable, correct? Because wood is flammable. That bench, our walls, the trees outside. So in this shloka, what is being shared is our experiences are not are not complete. So they're not going to make us complete. But deeper than your ego is your spirit. That is complete. So satyam param dhimahi, we contemplate to be one with our spirit, so we feel completeness. Dharma projita kaita votra paramo nirmat saranam satam vedyam vastava matra vastu shivadam tapatrayon mulanam shi mad bhagavate mahamuni krite. किं वा परेश्वर सद्यो हृदयृद्यतेमद्भागवत दो मेनी पीपल आर असोसिएटेड विथ सनातन धर्म वेरी फ्यू नो अबउट भागवत बट दिस इज बीन रिटन बाय महामुनि सो इन दाइएस्ट सेंस इट इज Bhagwan Narayana, who's written Bhagavatam, but in a more personal sense, it is Rishi Vyasa. In Sanatana Dharma, there is no founder. Tell me, what time did Sanatana Dharma start? What place did it start in? There is no founder, but certainly, a fundamental facet of Sanatana Dharma is Rishi Vyasa. His relationship with the Upanishads. He has composed the Mahabharata. He has composed Shrimad Bhagavatam. So all of the maps that we associate with, they are associated or attributed to Rishi Vyasa. So this is one of the small meanings in this grand mantra. Hari Om and greetings from Cleveland. Yesterday night. we had a powerful workshop on balancing the mind with vedanta balancing the mind with vedanta and i had shared with all of the seekers that were joining me four perspectives from outside in on how to balance the mind the outermost perspective was a medical perspective then coming closer to that a sociological perspective coming closer than that was a psychological perspective and what was the closest perspective 
a spiritual perspective, a spiritual perspective. And what I had shared with everyone, our mental health, whether it's good or not good, depends on awareness. As an example, suppose I'm experiencing anxiety, but I go to sleep, then am I still experiencing anxiety? No. That mental equipment is now dormant. So the anxiety is dormant too. Our mental health depends on awareness. Awareness does not depend on mental health. So if I can get to the deepest perspective that I am awareness, then my mental health will be most balanced. And another word for awareness in Sanskrit is bha. Bha leg bhagavan. Bha leg bhagavatam. Bha means light. It is the light of awareness by which we know fire and electricity and mesh Wi-Fi <laughs> and so on. Srimad Bhagavatam is a dialogue between someone who knows and someone who wants to know. The ones who want to know ask six questions. Imagine you got to meet a wise person and you had to ask them six questions. What would you ask them? What's your favorite restaurant? <laughs> <laughs> so the six questions that are asked are, <clears throat> What is the greatest good for all? That's how the questions start. What is the greatest good for all? Question two, what is the purpose of avatara? So keywords are good. Next keyword is purpose. Question three, what is the performance of avatara? For all of the younger people, I'm not saying avatar. I'm not concerned about James Cameron raising billions of dollars. I am saying avatara and the performance of our avatars, like Bhagavan Varaha, etc. Question four, what are the passings of avatars? Then, perhaps the main question is, what is the play or leela of avatars specifically about Bhagavan Krishna? The grandest section of Srimad Bhagavatam revolves around Bhagavan Krishna. And now the sixth question, the one that we are immersed in now, what is the home of Dharma? Keyword being home. When Bhagavan Krishna was physically present, he was the home of Dharma. Wherever he went, Dharma was an act. But now he's gone back to his infinite nature. So now where does dharma go? In this course, we are now in our 159. We have answered the first five questions and are answering the sixth question. What is the home of dharma? This dialogue is being facilitated by Rishi Shuka and Raja Parikshita slash us. When we study Bhagavad Gita, I have often encouraged all of you with pencil to cross out the word Arjuna and put your name there. So one of his names is Partha. You can put a nickname of yours there, good or, <laughs> good or bad. But really, who is Bhagavan Krishna speaking to? You. For you to feel that. We are listening in to this dialogue, trying to feel that Rishi Shuka is speaking to us. Now, when I was studying Srimad Bhagavatam, Pujaswami Tejo Mayananda had shared, Rishi Shuka is actually in contemplation while he's teaching. His eyes are closed, he is communing with his own nature and whatever's coming out of him is coming out of him. And when Puja Swami Tejo Mayanada shared that with me, with all of us, the first time I heard this was in November of 2005, almost 20 years ago. 
when I was in our yatra a couple of weeks ago, and I was preparing for Vedanta and Bhagavata, I finally understood what he meant, that even to listen to Srimad Bhagavatam, you have to listen from a contemplative position or feeling. If you really want to feel like Raja Parikshita, you have to contemplate to be able to listen. Which leads me to, <clears throat> what is the difference between a course like Vedanta and Bhagavata and a workshop? A two-day workshop or a four-day evening workshop? Tell me, what's the difference between a year-long course, for us, years-long course, and a short period workshop. Anyone? No. Commitment. You can also share online. We have lots of people here, lots of people online. I heard commitment. Discipline. Discipline. Doctrine. Doctrine. Okay. You're right. My observation is workshops tend to be more action-oriented. Courses tend to be more reflection-oriented. A workshop is short-term. The shortest term for what we do is our action. Courses are long-term. What's more long-term than action is reflection. And so I'm encouraging all of you, be patient. If you can't contemplate and listen, fine. At least be patient and listen. This is not a workshop. This is a course which you have to personalize. Last week's class was immense. And all of you were there last week, yes? Yes. <clears throat> In our culture, we have a word. It's an intimidating word called papa. What does papa mean in English? <laughs> Sit. We have a family who's in this course, and the husband's name is Akshay, and the wife's name is Kamini. And they have two daughters. <laughs> and when I first met them, their daughters used to call their father Papi, and their, <laughs> and their mother Kamini. <laughs> they didn't know, okay? Instead of Papa, Papi, yes? Papi, like casually. And instead of Kamini, Kamini. <laughs> Those are not good words. So slowly I had to educate them that you are strongly insulting. Call your parents dumb instead of Papi and Kamini. <laughs> That's better. Papa, the etymology of this word is, comes from Pati. Pati means to protect. Papa or a sin protects ignorance. That means you're going through an experience, but you're not learning from it. It is a wasted experience. We just want me Chinmay and Ananda shared, a papa is when you move away from yourself. So now why I'm sharing this, the third chapter focuses on how there's a creator and in a macro scale, when creation moves away from the creator, what happens to creation? What is the effect of atrophy on society? Rishi Shuka specifically shares with Raja Parikshita and us when deception, untruth, idleness, sleep, Cruelty, sorrow, delusion, fear, and wretchedness prevail. Then there is Kali Yuga, which is dominated by Tamas. Do you feel that these vices are prevalent in society? Undoubtedly, they are. So as Raja Parikshita is listening to all of this, he asks, how can one be safe from all of this negativity, all of these vices? He really wants to know what these vices and this negativity is so he can prevent himself from succumbing to all of this. 
And put simply, Rishi Shuka shares, when the worshipful Lord, the supreme person, enters into the hearts of people, where does Bhagavan live? In your heart. When you forget it, that is Papa. That it, the creator lives inside of me, but I feel the creator is far away. He destroys all the evil wrought in the minds by Kali through food, place of residence, and sense contacts. So I'm again trying to summarize, then I'm going to open up last week's class. When creation moves away from the creator, selfishness grows. What is the antidote to this? Rishi Shuka shares, feel the divinity that lives in your heart. And if divinity lives in your heart, divinity also lives in all hearts. That is what selflessness is. Here is our framework again. The first period of creation is known as Krita Yuga. It is the golden age. In this period, people's personalities are dominantly sattvic or quiet. Now, at a macro level, creation continues with atrophy. The second period is known as Treta Yuga, or the Copper Age. People's personalities have become rajasic or aggressive. Ravana is a good example of that. Atrophy continues. The third age of our society is known as Dwapara Yuga. That is when Bhagavan Krishna is present. This is the Silver Age. And people's personalities are predominantly a combination of Raja and Tama, aggressive and lazy. And when Sri Krishna or Bhagavan Krishna's Nama and Rupa are dissolved, that is when Kali Yuga begins. What Swami Tapasyananda has shared, I am using this book to study Srimad Bhagavatam in detail for all of our new students. This is an edition that is shared by the Ramakrishna mission. People are dominantly filled with Tama. This period began 3102 BC. I think the terminology of BC has changed and I don't know what that terminology is, but 3102, so more than 5,000 years ago which means we are only in the beginning of society becoming selfish. And yeah, exactly, you know, you we're laughing out of fear, you know, we're crying, crying inside. It is going to become more and more and more intense. So what is the message? Get enlightened and get out. Or be ready for exponential more harshness. More selfishness. Being more specific about this now. In the golden age, and sorry, Kali Yuga is known as the steel age. If you think of value, gold, copper, silver, then steel. Okay. When we are closest to divinity, we live by four values. Those four values in English are Integrity, compassion, openness, tapa is openness, and the fourth is generosity. Say them back to me again. What was number one? Integrity. Two? Compassion. Three? Four? Very good. Now, as we move away from ourselves, from our nature, these four vices start to attack these values and it's almost like laziness starts to overcome quietness. These four vices are the opposite of integrity is hypocrisy. Do you know hypocritical people? <laughs> the opposite of compassion? To be violent. Violence. I don't know how to make that perfectly aligned with compassion, but we'll share violence. The opposite, opposite of openness, it's asantosha, which means to be ungrateful. 
to be ungrateful, then not, nothing ever satisfies you, correct? I find a lot of younger people, they're ungrateful, and this is expressed as I'm always bored. Yes? See how this lives. And the opposite of generosity is selfishness, where there's resources, but whose resources are these? My resources. So the values, imagine if there's a scale. At the beginning, lots of values, little vices. At the end, there's lots of vices, little values. Now, this all sounds quite systematic and negative, but Rishi Shuka has also shared what to do to stay safe from these vices. For those who are closest to their divinity, it is dhyana. That is to contemplate. When we're further away, it is yagas or macro rituals. What we did today, as you can see, is like a yaga. When we're further away, it is Puja, which is a micro ritual. When you come to this ashram, we learn about collective worship, but then this is to be practiced in your individual worship, which is puja. And when we are the farthest away from ourselves, what is the antidote to these vices? Japa. Japa. The etymology of the word japa also includes the word pati. Papa means protecting ignorance. Jan <clears throat> Japa means protecting janma. Japa is that which helps you not to be born into limits anymore. To be born into dependence. Knowing how important Japa is, I had asked all of you to bring your mala to today's class. Can you show me your malas? Everyone else was too busy with, let me read it, hypocrisy, violence, being ungrateful, selfishness. <laughs> I have lots to think about you, but my mala is with me. So I'm going to share very quickly how to use a japa mala in a more sacred way. First, I'll show you the unsacred way. This is how my children use their mala. They use both hands and all fingers. <laughs> and they start, you know, they'll say, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. And it kind of goes faster. It's like, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. And then they feel this middle part is a special bead. <laughs> the clasp is the most powerful bead for them. But our children are four and six. The fact that they're even mechanically doing this and the fact that they feel that Puja Swami Tejo Mayananda gave them this mala and this mantra, at the end of it, they do go like this. They bring it to their head and their hearts and their hands. And then every once in a while, they'll say, you need it in your head too and put it on my head too. <laughs> so here's how I would like for you to hold your mala. Right hand, ring finger. What is the Sanskrit word for your ring finger? Anamika. Anamika means nameless, meaning more important than your name is whose name you're taking, as in Bhagavan. So we use our ring finger a lot. Anamika. That is a nice name for you and for whoever else. Now, these beads, in this case, a Rudraksha, these symbolize thoughts, thoughts. So how you hold these thoughts, the ring finger is holding the mala with your middle finger and your thumb. Your middle finger symbolizes your intellect and your thumb symbolizes divinity. And you pull these beads towards you. So a very simple mantra is Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. I'm pulling it towards me. I'm not shooting at you. Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya. I'm pulling my thoughts towards me. Okay, everyone sees that flow. And for all of our silence retreaters, I had shared, when you chant with the mind, you're raising the quality of your thoughts. So then what happens? You reduce the quantity of your thoughts. 
So then what happens? You redirect the flow of your thoughts. Now, please see the system. This ring finger is my mind. It's holding this mantra. And the fulfillment of this is now my intellect is engaged too. From chanting with the mind to inquiring with the intellect. But where is that direction going? To divinity. That is my thumb. So once again, and for the sake of Bhagavatam, Shri Krishna Sharanam Mama. Shri Krishna Sharanam Mama. Shri Krishna Sharanam Mama. Or in English, I am joy. I am joy. I am joy. When you get to the class or the Meru mm, Rudraksha, that's the bead that's extending. You are not to use that to chant, but you're supposed to turn the mala around and go again. Okay? You go again. And the reason for that, it's almost like, remember back in the day, if you were watching TV, and it was 11 o'clock. What happened at 11 o'clock? I remember when I was watching TV, when I was allowed to stay up to 11, there was a PSA. What does PSA stand for? Public service announcement. It's 11 o'clock. Where are your children? You don't remember that? See, some people remember that. And it's on The Simpsons, so it's true. <laughs> I love this episode. So Homer's watching TV, everyone's asleep, it's dark, and 11 o'clock comes, and this PSA on the TV says, where are your children? And Homer shouts back, I don't know, I told you yesterday. <laughs> so this accentuated bead is to make sure that this is not being mechanical, but you're being intentional, okay? This is a course. A course means you have to reflect more. It means to be patient. A message is shared with you in one week. You are to reflect on it. And if you have, when the review comes, it becomes more real. Now I continue just a little bit with this next chapter. I was to share much more, but I only have one minute. So I'm not gonna share too much. This is the second last chapter of Upadesha. In this chapter, Rishi Shuka talks about pralaya. Tell me what pralaya means in English. Calamity. Calamity. Dissolution, that's better. I, I, I had heard someone say, I had asked, what does pralaya mean? Someone said pralaya. <laughs> so laya, some of you have gone from sattva to laya. What does laya mean? You've gone to sleep. <laughs> Pralaya means a comprehensive sleep. There are four types of pralaya. The most short term is called nitya pralaya, which means regular <clears throat> dissolution. Before I continue, does anyone remember what the theme of this chapter is? What's the theme of this chapter? Apashraya, and give me an English word for that. Dissolution. Because in this chapter, Rishi Shuka goes away. Raja Parikshita goes away. So Rishi Shuka is sharing here that there are types of dissolution. The lightest one is known as Nitya Pralaya which means regular dissolution. And the shloka that I will read to you next week talks about this body going through regular dissolution. Now, there's many, many people who are involved in the medical field here. Is it true that every cell of our body changes every seven years? Or a whole lot of them, a majority of cells change? So now, if Someone is 42 years old. That means they've gone through six complete changes of their body. So now if I were to ask you, which one are you? Really, which one are you? If you had six different last names, which is your last name? Also, 
Let me ask a few questions. Vinod, right? No, no, Rajiv. Ravi. Ravi. Okay. Ravi, what time did you sleep last night? <laughs> I'm glad it's the morning and not the daytime. <laughs> Manu, what time did you sleep? 10. AM, PM, I guess we're making that distinction. PM. Um, Rashmi, you? 11 PM, okay. Now here's where I say that they're all lying. And now, even though they know that I'm gonna about to teach them, still they feel offended by it. If you know what time it is, that means you're not sleeping, sleeping correct? If you know it's 12.30, 10.30, 11, that means you're awake. But when you are sleeping, you don't know what time it is. You don't know what your body weight is. You don't know your family. You don't know that space and time even exist. That's that regular dissolution, correct? Your body goes away, your mind goes away, your intellect goes away. Nitya pralaya. Clear? Here's number two. Naimittika pralaya. This is more long-term. Right now, I'm just going to be brief about this. It is when creation dissolves into the creator. Creation dissolves into the creator. Put poetically, Bhagavan Brahma goes to sleep. Nitya Pralaya, you go to sleep, as in creation. Naimitika Pralaya, Bhagavan Brahma goes to sleep. And it's so lovely. Do you know where Bhagavan Brahma sleeps? You have an address. This is 3105 Farnham Road, correct? Where does Bhagavan Brahma sleep? He sleeps in Bhagavan Narayana. What an awesome sleeping place. See how awesome Sanatana Dharma is? Bhagavan Brahma sleeping in Bhagavan Narayana and Bhagavan Narayana sleeping too. <laughs> Sanatana Dharma is all about rest. <laughs> now, this is a pralaya you may not know about. It's called Prakrita Pralaya. Prakrita Pralaya is when the creator or Bhagavan Brahma is dissolved. He's not sleeping anymore. He's dissolved. Now, who remains? Only Bhagavan Narayana. Then. So far, so good. But here's the most important pralaya. It's called Atyantika Pralaya. Say it back to me. Atyantika Pralaya. Atyantika Pralaya is when you become Bhagavan Narayana. See, in the previous one, there was Bhagavan Narayana, but not you. But in the final dissolution, it is the dissolution of the ego, you become Bhagavan Narayana. There's lots to think about this, but I can't help myself but read the last three paragraphs of this chapter. I'm going to read it in English. Everyone close their eyes. Try to contemplate on what Rishi Shuka is sharing to you. This book of ancient wisdom was communicated by the Rishi Narayana to Rishi Narada, who in turn instructed sage Krishna Dvaipayana in it. That is Rishi Vyasa. O king, that is Raja Parikshita, out of his abundant love, that sage, also known as Badarayana, transmitted to me, his son, that is Rishi Shuka, this great text of the Bhagavata, which is equal to the Veda itself. keeping your eyes closed and contemplating. And there's a very subtle teaching and change that happens here. Oh, the noblest of the Kurus, this Sutta, who is sitting in our midst, Rishi Shuka is teaching Raja Parikshita, and there's many 
who have joined this satsang, including Rishi Sutta, who is listening to all of these details, will in the future narrate the Bhagavata at Naimi Sharanya, at the long-drawn satra on being questioned by Shaunaka and other rishis. Gently open your eyes. Srimad Bhagavatam starts with six questions, six answers. The questions are two. The questions are asked by Rishi Shaunaka. They're answered by Rishi Sutta. But where did he learn the answers from? The dialogue of Rishi Shuka and Raja Parikshita. Now Raja Parikshita is hinting. He has learned all of this, and he is going to teach this in the future. The implication is Rishi Shuka is going away, going away, but the greater implication is the fact that you are listening to this shows how this goes on in, in a perpetual motion. You are experiencing Srimad Bhagavatam. Oh.